And here we are again with John Reed of Diginomica. And guess what? I have a super special treat for you today because it's the podcast debut of fellow Diginomica partner, Alex McQueen. How are you? Hello. I am good. My brain is full. Yes, we are at UI Path Forward in Las Vegas, your favorite American destination. Just kidding. <laughs> anyway, we have had quite the schedule the last couple of days. And so our job in the next however many minutes is to make sense of what we just saw, which is going to be an interesting challenge. Uh, there's a little bit of background noise, listeners. Uh, I could not find the quietest space in the world, but I think this is going to be good enough. So just bear with us. This is the price we pay to extract live insights before you and I collapse in a collective haze of sleep deprivation. <laughs> that haze is coming. So I think a lot of people don't know necessarily that you're the real secret sauce and engine behind Diginomica, but you are, so let's just face it. That's the truth. And I want readers to know kind of some of your obsessions because you have some obsessions that inform your work. I'd like to think I'm the geekiest member of Diginomica, but I'm not, unfortunately, when it comes to technology. You're a real tech no geek. Is that fair? That is fair to say. I am incredibly curious about technology. Yes. In fact, you brought some of that up in one of our interviews today. I did. <laughs> you were drawing some parallels between LLM outputs and... Cisco packet tracing. Yes. Okay. So we have your techno geek credentials. So I, I have to give those up to you. I'm going to hold on to my AI geek credentials because I'm working on AI certification. So I get to keep that, but you get the rest. Okay. And then you also have a lot of data and analytics obsessions. I do. I absolutely love data and I can get lost in it like a little going down a rabbit hole for hours and have no idea where the time is gone. And that's reflected in some of the coverage you do because some of the vendors you're cover, you cover for us are heavy into the data space. Most recently, your click coverage. So, uh -huh. so this is kind of reflected. And one of the cool things I like about working with you is that we have a lot of contributors who have like, you know, a lot of enterprise decades under their belt. We thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool to find someone who wasn't jaded by the enterprise and came into it with fresh eyes? And so when you joined us, God, number of years ago now. It's coming up for five now. Yeah, you brought, you brought some of that sensibility, I think. And I think that's been cool, right? Because you, you've approached these questions from a different angle, but you've also, especially with data, I think you made a strong connection from the beginning with, hey, these are fundamentally the same problems, right? Absolutely. No, it's been interesting because I, I, when I first started, I felt as though there was so much lacking in my knowledge. And when you start a new role, people automatically say, well, you don't have to know everything, but you still feel as though there's a responsibility to continue your learning. But some of the things that I've been able to look at with an objective view from, from the vendors that we cover has been absolutely so fundamentally um, interesting from being able to go and really look for answers and press on some dif different angles. And I think this is really important because one of the things that I worry about a lot is that when I go back like 15 years ago, there was like a whole bunch of like independent blogger analysts, upstarts with a lot of ask tough questions, be grouchy curmudgeons, and like, and I don't see the next generation coming for the most part. And so, I think to some extent, like maybe what you don't appreciate is you came to us without a lot of unlearning to do around bullshit like, sorry, folks, uh, you know, trapezoids, quadrants, waves, like s what I would consider like not necessarily irrelevant things, but kind of like limited ways of looking at the enterprise, a lot of paper play nonsense that goes on in our industry that we do our utmost to try to avoid. But we all have challenges with disclosure and transparency. But the point is, like it was really refreshing for us to, we didn't have to bring any of that crap with you. You brought a whole different perspective. And so I think my thought on that before we get into UiPath, which I want to get into in a sec is, what would you advise other folks who are drawn to like looking at the enterprise in a, in a fresh and interesting way, but might also feel a little intimidated by, let's face it, some of this stuff is a little intimidating, right? The people that have all this expertise how would you suggest navigating that? Absolutely. And I think sometimes I'm still navigating it. The The imposter syndrome can sometimes loom. But I think one of the biggest things that has made a difference for me is having people around you that encourage your learning. 
and support asking questions, who are happy to just share their knowledge and talk with you rather than at you and and say, all right, if this interests you, go and find out more about it. We'll help if you need. And that makes such a huge difference to be able to learn. And I think one of the things that also comes out in your coverage is that, correct me if I'm off here, but I think more and more as you've written more stuff for us, and you, so I encourage folks to check some of your recent articles, but I think you found your angles into topics. So instead of like, how do I understand this vendor? You're like, wait, I can actually relate some of these data and analytics struggles customers are going through and these change issues, like which is fundamentally what we struggle with is the human side. You've been able to plug that into other things and kind of find your angles. Absolutely. That's where my background's come from. Because when I did my MBA, everything was tied into a sort of organizational strategy. So that's how I was taught to be able to look at things and everything comes back to your strategy. And having worked in organisations where data was a really valuable commodity, but it was damn near impossible to come by, that, if anything, made me more curious to be able to want to access it. And seeing people's struggles with data, like 15, 20 years later, uh, it's really interesting to see that some things haven't fundamentally changed. Right. And so now we have a situation where we have music playing in the background, which I did not really want. Oh, it's because the keynote is exiting, so hopefully that won't be too bad for the listener. Um, so uh, we're now in a situation where we, we can apply that approach that you have to UiPath because this is not your first UiPath show. You've been to more UiPath shows than me. Um, but at the same time, that creates an interesting perspective because UiPath has gone through quite a lot of change. We, we could, in the background, there's a lot of market challenges, and you can look at Diginomica for more on that. And then, of course, Daniel Dines resuming the CEO role. But I think the bigger thing is really the stuff around the fast evolution of AI and the positioning around agentic AI to the point where Dines went so far this week to declare this is a whole new act two for UiPath, which is a pretty strong statement from their original RPA roots and stuff. So how do you make sense yourself of all this change? Have you seen it from the different shows? Like, where are we? I have seen it from the different shows. Um, when I went to my first UiPath Forward a year ago, it was very much um, wanting to clarify that RPA had been a fundamental part of lots of different technologies for a very long time. That was their core bread and butter. That's who they were. And that was not going to change. They talked about AI in conjunction with that, but it was still very much focusing on the automation. Whereas this year, it's completely pivoted. And I think some are still a little out of their comfort zone in terms of working out where that strategy is going. Um, but everybody's completely on board. But I think they're they're still in very much a learning and changing curve. Trying to make sense of that is still taking time. So I think I've just been in a position to be able to listen and then absorb. I'll go away and process it and do some more research and then start trying to find my way towards being able to tell a proper story. We've had uh, quite the schedule this week. Our handlers did a, did a good job in addition to our own roaming, which is obviously free and hard to control. We had a bunch of sit downs, a uh, number of customers, also some executives, including Daniel Dines. What were your overall impressions from all of that? Free range roaming is usually the opportunity to get so many more insights than you get from your sit down interviews. Um, it is a little less organized and a little less staged. And I do like the opportunity to either sit down with people over a lunch table or at breakfast or just listen to conversations as people are going by um, because they're, they're so much more unfiltered. Um, from the discussions that I've been a part of that weren't organised, UiPath partners are very much on board and singing from the same hymn sheet. And I think they've already clued into that strategic sense of direction of where they're going. They feel needed. They have a purpose. They know and love their customers. And I think they're really on board with getting behind this and doing whatever they can to help customers understand and deliver and make those changes. From a customer's perspective, I think there's an awful lot of not exactly excitement, but determination to be able to 
go with what is being offered to them right now. I think there's an awful lot of goodwill given to UiPath by its customers just because it maintains the stance of we'll meet you wherever you are. They don't have an aura of being pushy about getting on board with different technologies or moving and migrating from on-prem to the cloud. Um, so their flexible approach is still really supportive. And I think that's that's won them an awful lot of, of brownie points with customers. From the executive's point of view, there's a lot of new faces this year. So I think some are still finding their way. Um, but their technical expertise is not to be uh, not to be doubted. Um, there is a genuine sort of curiosity and a drive to see how they can make this lo- this work. You and I both published our first pieces, and um, I, of course, I have these AI deep dives, and I just prior wrote a piece on why are AI, ag- AI agents being hyped to the point of absurdity, and yet despite the AI agent hype. At this show, well, you could say it was hyper, the emphasis perhaps. I wasn't as grouchy at this show, and I explained why, but I think it was interesting in the context of the UI path because one of the reasons I wasn't as grouchy is because I thought they did a good job of explaining how all of their work with robotic process automation and existing automations for customers really fits well into this agent world. So it was less about like, oh, AI agents are the cool new thing, like, and more about like, yeah, we have a we have a special advantage here because we can connect the dots between this new emerging technology, which has its certain pros and cons, and this other technology. And I just haven't seen that this this event tour that kind of messaging around agents. And so, in my piece that I wrote today, I said I'm not as grouchy as I thought I would be. Unbelievably, but yeah, yeah, it's actually true. I never thought I'd see the day that John Reed would go to an event and go, wow, this is good. Yeah, and I wrote, I actually like the keynotes too, which is a <laughs> real the real shocker. And you guys can read more on that as well if you want to get a few more details on why I thought that was the case. But uh, but anyway, I just think that's that's interesting because that's a nice message for their customers, right? To be able to say not only like, was this like investment in RPA not in vain, but in fact, continue along that path because it's going to work well with, that's a really nice message for customers to hear in so far as to even go so far as to put on their, their slide today. They had a slide of takeaways from day one that I put in my article, but it says AI agents are not to be trusted. That's a pretty strong statement. It's incredibly strong. I did not see that one coming. Um, I've been to plenty of events where people have talked about, you know, with a slightly cautious tone and then gone on to eulogise about how they're putting in place government uh, governance. But it's it, that in comparison to how it's been today comes across as virtual sig- virtue signalling because UiPath have been really just firm and they haven't beaten about the bush. It's all been very much, all right, these are the things you absolutely need to know. These are the boundaries you've got to set. However, I did I did say about UiPath that I think there was a missed opportunity to some extent, although I think they did a decent job with this more than other vendors. But one of my big arguments for the problem with AI agents is more the overdose, because however helpful they're going to be, it's hard for me as a customer to go back to my project right now and do something amazing that's going to help my company save money or time with an AI agent today. I can start experimenting with it using things like they're generally available autopilot for everyone or whatever. And then you can sign up for agent builder that's coming in 45 days. So you can do some stuff. But as far as the emphasis, I would have liked to see a little bit more on how customers are basically kicking butt with stuff now. And like after the keynote, for example, I went over to a presentation with Colaguard, which does this amazing stuff on uh, colon cancer detection and stuff like that. And it was amazing stats that they shared on how UiPath has assisted with their whole endeavor of improving their workflows and improved auto, you know, identification rates and testing and stuff like that. And this is just a really important story. And so that would be like, if I were to pick like what I think they could have done even better would have been to get a story like that up on the keynote stage as well so that people can see, wow, I can have a huge impact 
with what I have in play right now. And they did a bit of that, but I think they could have really gone more. So that would be my thing. I think you're absolutely right. Some of those um, additional sessions after the keynotes were incredibly valuable. Um, and the, it does feel like they were a little tucked away. They could have had a little bit more of that up front just to sort of maximize the opportunity for impact. But yeah, you're right. Now, we did a bunch of customer interviews as well. Was there any thing that really stood out for you, either in terms of benefits or just insights? I know you mentioned one thing in our meeting with Daniel Dines that struck you from one customer. Was there anything that kind of jumped out that was like, oh, that's really interesting? The thing from the the customer that we spoke to today, um, there was, just for context, there was a bit of a montage this morning uh, in which uh, Dines had talked about um, wanting to be able to free his mind. And when that came up, I was just like, all right, what does that even mean? And it took me a little while. And then I talked to a customer and she said that they'd um, implemented a bot that would go away and process an invoice, but then it would go away and do a ton of stuff in the background after that. But the person using that didn't need to worry about it. They didn't have to care where it came from, what it was doing. It would just go away and this would get done. And that's it, it. that kind of gave them the, the free headspace to be able to go and get back on with their job and go and do something else that would add value. And that's what made me think that was my kind of click moment where I thought that really contextualizes it for me. Um, and it's really powerful to be able to hear that coming from a customer. It's one thing to see somebody talk about it theoretically on stage, but it's very different to hear somebody talk about it in, in reality. And there were so many examples that came from people talking about their their numbers and their impact. It was really powerful. So I think one of the reasons that UiPath, in my mind, had a very successful event is that they have the advantage of what I think of as the founder keynote advantage, which is founders like Daniel Dines just tend to have a little more freedom to speak their minds. And I think it makes for better keynotes. And so I thought, my opinion was, we, you and I haven't talked about this, but I thought yesterday, I thought it was really disarming and welcoming how he was quite candid about, you know, yes, there was, we're in this, in this whole new phase that was kind of like excitement, whatever, but he was candid about what the limitations were of their older approaches and how the traditional RPA approaches they used did have shortcomings. And one of which was the, in a, not inability, but real difficulty handling unstructured data and information. and how this opens up whole new possibilities and stuff. So I, I thought that was just disarming to just hear that, like, yeah, we, we've we struggled with this and here's what the what we're doing now. You don't usually hear that, so. No, it was, it was refreshing. I mean, plenty of vendors at events talk about listening to customer feedback and making changes and saying, oh, yeah, we've made mistakes, but this is what we're doing differently. He was very bold about that and he didn't add a but onto the end. It was very much, a, this is what we've changed. This is what we've realized. And then it was just left there. Yeah. And what I said to vendors is you could study this event because then on day two keynote, instead of what I refer to as something like uh, futuristic product gasms, <laughs> it's like, oh my God, here's our incredibly awesome thing that's coming. Instead of that, we got brain food. and. Uh, I, I'm forgetting the name of the Forrester person. Do you remember his name? Oh, Craig LeClaire. Yes. And, um, and there were a couple other so-called industry experts, academics. They went on stage for a substantial amount of time in this keynote today and talked about trends and issues, which weren't necessarily always flattering, I would say, to UiPath either. But it, I think that added tremendous credibility. So in other words, instead of getting promo stuff today in the keynote, we got a heavy dose of relevant brain food. Instead of motivational speeches, we got, here's the context that we're all operating in, and here's these profound changes we're going through. And since I kind of made fun of waves and quadrants, I got to give the Forrester individual, say his name again, I keep forgetting. Craig LeClaire. Yeah, see, we have no sleep. I'm operating on fumes <laughs> here. I thought he really brought like really solid stuff. I mean, he has studied automation for a long time and it showed. Absolutely. So I don't know what you thought, but I, to me, I was really impressed with a brain food keynote. I just don't see that. It was, yeah, I wasn't expecting it. It was usually you'd get the product super stop, you know, whistle stop tour of everything. And then the, the, you know, the perfect demos. 
it made such a, a change and it was so well informed by people who were objective. They talked about, you know, what's been perhaps missing from some of those agentic AI conversations, how it's contextualized for people, um, missteps in really being able to define it clearly so that people work out exactly what it means and what it's not good for. Um, the emphasis on security, like you said, about not trusting an AI agent, the need to be able to say, don't give it your personal login credentials because it doesn't, you, you mustn't. It's, it, they were so emphatic about that. It was more sort of guardrails and warnings about how to apply this going forward and really, I think, raising awareness of, of what people are going to get their hands on. Yeah, and, and even some adoption curve stuff. That was like, yeah, it's, this is going to take a while. Yeah, yep. it's there's been so much pressure on on investors to be able to show that return on investment, and again, they've been very open, very transparent about you know the fact that yes, it might take a while to see it, but it's scalable, and there's opportunities to build on everything that's gone before it, and a lot of the hard work has already been done. Yeah, and then and then the cool thing about the setup was towards the end saying like. Then bringing it back into, here's what UiPath is going to do about it. And also saying, look, we can, we can make this um, adoption curve. We can improve the reliability and accuracy. We can take the edge off some of the challenges. And then poor people, instead of like making them sit and listen to another hour of how we're going to do it, head off into your tech ed sessions and go find out how this fits into a UiPath context. So vendors, if you're listening, that's how to get it done and how to turn keynotes into a valuable experience into what I typically call a, ch a chance to catch up on my email exercise. Not meaning me. I would never do that, of course. Of but, course not. But in general, attendees, right? Okay, so we, we, we've we issued some some good kudos, and, and I think those were well-earned because I'd never say anything nice about keynotes ever, really. Um, at least, especially about the whole keynote. Sometimes I'll pick one thing I liked. Um, Let's talk just a little bit more. We touched on a little bit what challenges, like what do you see are a couple of the biggest challenges for UiPath to kind of deliver on this? I think consistency in messaging is going to be essential for them because although they stipulated a lot of re very clear guidance and definitions today, I think it's going to be important for people to be able to see that over and over and over because otherwise that message is going to get lost amid the racket that is going on about agentic AI from plenty of other vendors right now. And I think managing those expectations with, with customers and potential customers is going to be essential. And if you were advising a customer that's feeling a little overwhelmed by all of this, where do you think they should start? That's a good question. You didn't say you were going to ask me any hard questions today. It's a today. hard question, isn't it? <laughs> Where do you start? Where Especially do anyone start? Especially for someone who hasn't had more than a few hours sleep because you're up at 4 a.m. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But this is a good one, though. It's a good question. God love jet lag. Um, all right. So I would say that one of the first places to start is, is do your homework. This is not going to be something that you can just kind of Google and look up. Um, there's going to be multiple sources that you have to look to and not just the vendor. I think digging for use cases is going to be a challenge, but there are some out there. Um, looking at objective views from academics and researchers is also going to be absolutely essential. Um, but I think some of that is just kind of pushing past the, the first one page definition. This is going to have to go for looking for use cases across the enterprise to try and see what the, the mix is and try and get an objective view that shows a balance of the pros and cons and what it really means. I mean, for example, the, the slides that we saw from Forrester this morning were very clear and gave some very helpful definitions. Um, but I think the other aspect is to come at it from looking at what problem you want to solve rather than just going, we need to implement something. It's got to be focused on a solution. I'm going to add one more because obviously there's a bunch of things customers can do, but I think there is an AI readiness component, and I think getting advisory on what to do about data is is going to be really important because so much of the good result is going to come down to relevant data. And in particular, now that you're talking about much more savvy ability to use unstructured data, there's a whole lot of interesting questions there around 
to what extent do, should I put some structure to my unstructured data, which Mark Green included in one of his action points uh, that we talked with yesterday with Mark. But you won't always have to do that. In some cases, your unstructured data will be fine the way it is. I think you're, I think customers are going to need a whole lot of advice around what the, what the proper data is going to be for the use cases they pursue. And so that would be, if I had to pick one, I'm going to pick that. Mm -hmm. I think the other, okay. sorry, the other thing I think is they've got to get their organizations ready for change. Right. This is not going to be achievable in 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 the current environment if they aren't set Didn't up for that change. Did we hear something like that? Fifteen percent of this is technology. Someone said, I think it was something like that. That's right. Yeah. So that holds. So there's a lot of change work ahead. Absolutely, it's got to be a right. full change project, and it's got to involve the the entire organization. Sure, start small if you're going to try testing it as a you know proof of proof of concept, see if it works. But the whole idea about getting your your house in order. And looking at your culture, uh, I think is going to be essential. Indeed. Well, I think I'm not going to ask you any more hard questions because I think you've 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 earned a break from from that. For My a while. brain hurts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess we should say that we also broke another one of my conference rules which is to actually make it to the concert we we made the end of earth wind and fire baby we did we so, were dancing it was yep. so much fun yep that was that was a rare wonderful treat absolutely an absolute joy no doubt so yep usually i'm cranky about music at concerts but hey if you can catch earth wind and fire Boogie Wonderland. They were still feeling it too. So, oh, absolutely. Good role models for aging with, <laughs> with, gra with grace and style, as we should all aspire to. Absolutely. Any final thoughts? It's just been a pleasure to see you interacting with with customers when you're in those sessions, and um, the way that you take your approach to talking with executives. I'm still, as I've said, very much learning. Um, so some of those interviews that I've done in the past over, over like over the last 18 months, I'm still finding my way. Um, but it's really interesting to see you being able to get to the heart of some of the issues without having to go into the absolute technical nitty gritty. Obviously you've done your AI homework and that's something that you're, you're clearly, you know, really invested in for your own education, as well as being able to talk to vendors about it. But being able to bring all of that experience from other vendors and then see that in action has been a real pleasure. So oh. if, if anything, it's just been worth it for that. Hey, man, that's cool to know that the the grind is pay pays off sometimes. But yeah, it's it's it every every day it feels like you know you try to approach it fresh and you know and I remember like yesterday we'll. Mark Green, that he was good enough to meet with us at 6 p.m. So we're all like at our last thing, right? <laughs> we know there's like a really awesome dinner waiting for us, but it's not, we're not there yet. Exactly. So we got to make gasp. that push. And like that to me is the whole thing about, you know, thinking about our audience and how this isn't like just for me, this is for them, you know? And so you and I have to make one more push and get those things done. And Absolutely. so that feels really good when you like, get that done yeah the people that we're talking to they will have been doing this or some of them will have been doing it all day for, yeah. for the last couple of days and they're always have to be yeah. on for these events they're taking time out of that to be able to speak to us and i think it's so important to put the work in ahead of it yeah no doubt well the goal is that every situation should be memorable that's how i look at it and like because I don't want to cast aspersions on anyone because I know this job can become a grind sometimes. But I do see situations where I feel like I'll overhear interviews where it feels like everyone's kind of going through the motions mm -hmm. of getting market updates. And I'm like, gosh, thank God I, we're doing it differently. And, and of course, our challenge is to prove that being different can also be really successful. And so we have, to, we have a lot to prove at Diginomica. Absolutely. But I, but I like that idea of like, Every time, even if it's end of the friggin' day and we're all tired, like we got to find the jugular in there somewhere, and yeah, and you know, you, in in a way that evokes everyone's passion, right? Because you know, my whole thing is like this is all about making projects better, and if we can do that, then then we're good. Exactly. I hope we're good. Army, well, yeah, army crawling towards the end of it, I think, but yeah, absolutely, and that that kind of the buzz that you get from it is contagious. It, it, you can yeah. see it reflected in other people and you know they just want to talk to somebody that can relate to them well you almost didn't get here because of weather and flights and you made it <laughs> and so glad you really perked up my five weeks on the road because 
The rest of them are, are solo flights for me. So I don't know how you do it. I really no more don't. Diginomica tag team for me. So anyway, listeners, I hope you enjoyed getting to know Alex a little better. We're going to have to leave that there. There's a whole lot more we could cover. A lot of interesting news around a uh, UI Pass partnerships. They're choosing a pretty agnostic role, but they did have significant partnerships announce, announcements with vendors like Anthropic and Inflection AI because UiPath at this time isn't building their own large language models, which is pretty common. So a lot of interesting stuff to get into. We'll try to get into some of that in our coverage, but we're going to leave it here now. And I also want to say sorry for the outbreak of background noise, but I've made the genius decision to start recording outside of a keynote that was in <laughs> progress. That wasn't totally brilliant on my part, but we were short on quiet spaces. Yeah, so this is choice what it was is. limited. But I hope listeners that stuck with that got their reward with a more coherent conversation at the end. And with that, it's time for whatever we can rummage in terms of snacks and relaxation. Goodbye. <laughs>